Good morning, everyone. Good morning, and uh, welcome to this third seminar on pedagogical resources for human rights. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, for this first presentation, we are going to be hearing from Carlos Muniz Osorio, who is going to help us lay the foundations of eco-pedagogy and eco-pacifism as keys in education for environmental and human rights. Carlos Agustin Muniz Osorio is, uh, uh, comes from the town of uh, Dorado, located in Puerto Rico. Um, he was a bio biology uh, teacher and studied teacher training in the University of Puerto Rico. This is where the Echo Path project uh, started. He's got 20, more than 20 years of experience in a number of different uh, educational centers and uh, projects on mathematics, ecology, and peace culture. He also directed the Puerto Rico section of Amnesty International for uh, some years and, was, and participated in uh, the uh, Educating for Freedom project. Um, as well as uh, in multiple festivals on children's uh, rights. He's interested in eco-pacifism, eco-pedagogy, ecology, and uh, all of this uh, from a Caribbean perspective. He works on teacher training, and uh, he's got uh, three children, Naomi, Lid, Lorenzo, and uh, Daniela. A warm round of applause for him. Thank you very much. Carlos, the floor is all yours. Good morning to everyone. It is a pleasure and an honor for me to uh, be opening this uh, second day of the seminar. I'm very motivated and uh, I was happy to be able to hear the previous speakers yesterday. So I'm very happy to give you the Caribbean perspective. I'm going to be having a timer here to uh, respect the time that's been allocated to me. Fine, I would like to share with you this uh, echo pedagogy and echo pacifism uh, uh, view um, in and I'm going to be talking from my experience. Let me first of all thank our colleagues from Escura and especially Saida for their support uh, in uh, translating this text that I am showing you up on the screen. Uh, thanks for your patience, of course. Um, so here we want to, I want to share a perspective of echo pedagogy and echo pacifism. Um, well, where do I come from? Well, this is Puerto Rico, an archipel in the Caribbean. And uh, the people there talk about the island of Puerto Rico, but it's not just an, an island, it's a, a group of islands, an archipelago. Let me tell you more about me. And what I do, this is Dorado, this is my uh, town of origin, this is where I come from. We've got some mountains there called Mogotes. They're not very high really. And then we've got the beach, so uh, this is where I grew up. And I'm showing you this because, uh, well, um, I've always wanted to study the, the topics I'm now developing uh, and this is due to the place where I was born and uh, where I grew up. My dad used to take me uh, out fishing and I was stung by bees and now I've realized that it was a privilege to be stung by bees there because there aren't any bees anymore there. And something that used to be very simple in my childhood has been completely lost and forever. Let me take you uh, to the north of Puerto Rico, to Cataño, a very small, small coastal town that has a power station there. And it's important for me if, to tell you this. If you continue uh, eastwards, you will find Fajardo, 
This town is the town where the hurricanes come from. We get to the Elysian wind and normally hurricanes come from the east and it's Fajardo that faces them. More to the, yes, to the east, we have the islands Vieques and Culebra. They are small islands, small municipalities. Uh, Vieques is well known uh, because back in the 60s, well, Puerto Rico is a territory uh, that uh, is an associated free state of the US. It is a colony in terms of boundaries and uh, the possibilities we have. And so there was, and I found out in a map, there's a mark in the south of uh, Puerto Rico. And uh, that's where, well, from that line to the bottom, there are military practices going on still today. Well, Puerto Rico has more than 300 uh, beaches. Biek has got uh, 22 of them. If you like the beaches, uh, I will encourage you to come and visit us. So uh, here we've got Cahuas, Calle, and the southern part is more kind of a desert. And well, the island, you know, from San Juan to Ponce, which is in the south, uh, there's a 20 minute drive. And if you want to get there, you need two hours. If you want to make a full tour of the island, it takes you some hours. But if you cross the mountains, it's much, uh, well, it could take you four hours. Because all this invites you to dream and imagine things. Imagine you're in the Caribbean, right? It's warm, it's nice. You have uh, the sea breeze that you can experiment here. It's warmer back in, the, in Puerto Rico, but imagine you're there sunbathing, walking barefoot uh, on the sand. Imagine you see the fish jumping out of the water a complete and absolute paradise, right? There are many such spaces in Puerto Rico, but not only in Puerto Rico, of course, but we also have a coastal community called Piñones Loiza. And I'm showing you this as an example of uh, a, what we do. The population uh, is made up from uh, people that uh, were per persecuted, that descend from Africans, and little by little they uh, created this community. Um, if you go to Puerto Rico, it, this uh, um, community is very close to the airport and uh, they have uh, wonderful uh, food, quite oily by the way, but it's well known and people tend to go and visit that community. There's also a forest there. And uh, if, imagine, we have this swamp you see up on the screen. That's very interesting. Um, in previous decades, many people uh, told us that we couldn't uh, touch the uh, mangrove and uh, we, well, some people thought that the, the idea was, well, we are not touching the area, but we're not touching and we're not looking at the people who live in there. And this is why you have a situation of poverty, drug addiction, um, and there, and uh, the media, uh, tell us only about that side of the things. But there are many, many others that are going on in the area. If you look at these small uh, pictures of the, era, of the area, you see this, this is not Miami Beach. That was a, a project for the beach. Imagine a very long natural beach where you can walk on. 
with uh, forest, imagine, uh, imagine it full of uh, hotels and uh, privatized. And this was the idea, an idea that uh, went down from parents to children. So, um, on the other hand, in this area, there is a very strong cultural and social movement that is being ignored. And uh, that is what I want to show you here. Let's listen to this. This is the rhythm of the area, the music you'll be able to listen to in the area. Of course, Puerto Rico is small. That's true, but there are many differences uh, in the different municipalities. Um, the terms we use for food may vary. For instance, there are many different music styles. This one's more related to the coastal areas. It's African Caribbean. But it's been nurtured by uh, European music as well. You, you hear the drums. And men, there are many stories that are associated to this music as well. I just wanted you to hear this. I know you feel like dancing, but uh, hold it for some hours. Right, let's come back to the presentation. Remember, uh, I showed you the island of Puerto Rico some minutes ago. We've seen the north, the coastal area, the coastal area. We went to the islands, Vieques, Culebra. We went back to the mountains and to the southern part of the island. Dr. Ursana Domerez has a project that's uh, very interesting and that I want to share here. Um, because yesterday I was listening to previous speakers and everything they told us about were very um, close to everything we do in uh, Puerto Rico as well. So uh, this doctor carried out a PhD thesis on uh, how the community responded to the social and environmental challenges ahead of us. Surprisingly, most of the faces uh, or the people that uh, looked after the place were women, as you can see here on the screen. Women that worked at home, that had this excessive responsibility that a sexist society places on their shoulders, and they were the first ones to react before this terrible situation, this terrible uh, climate emergency. This colleague, Rosailda Ramos, is also working on many projects on the coastal area of uh, Costa Rica. This is the power station I told you about. And uh, in this area, for instance, there were peop many people having respiratory trouble. And uh, Rosailda went there to the power station, knocked on the door and asked why. She was given a reason and, uh, well, she believed it. That was back in the 60s on 70 and 70s, but she keeps investigating and looking into this matter and she finds things out and she realizes that this is not, uh, um, this is polluting us, this is killing us. This is not uh, steam, this is something else. Many of these women do so many things. They work at home, they look after their children, they look after the environment. But they're a clear example of how to look after the uh, environment and human rights. A colleague uses a very interesting metaphor here. Whenever we go to the beach when it's very sunny, we put on our sunglasses and that's it. Sometimes you feel a bit dizzy because you, your sunglasses may have uh, different colors, right? The thing is that somehow uh, the way we work and the way we do things in the world uh, is like these sunglasses uh, that prevent us from seeing the ones we've got in front of us or everything we've got around us. And when we take these sunglasses off, we'll be able to see the wonders of nature around us. 
So these women highlight the challenges they're facing, like, for instance, gender inequality. They say, well, whenever some cooking needs to be done, well, it is us, the women, who do so. And uh, at the same time, we've got to look after our, our children and uh, the environment. So this is a continuous learning process. So women had to sweep their homes, they were organizing the struggle, and they needed to sort things out somehow. They needed a strategy. There was a time when they realized this was so. And so what pedagogy was uh, used or created by these women who needed to train themselves because they were doing so many things, uh, they were participating in so many events and defending human rights and uh, environmental rights, that something needed to be done, right? This is a case of uh, Las Salinas, which is a landfill. So, um, let me share with you a very short story. It's not a joke, uh, just a very short story, right? There was someone in a party in a very rich house and said the prop the owner said okay i will give this house to the person who dives into the swimming pool there were some crocodiles there and someone plunged into the water and came out of it and uh, the owner congratulates this person and says oh great congratulations why why do you congratulate me someone pushed me into the swimming pool right what I mean by this is that when we talk about global warming, we were warned a long time ago there are irreversible things that happened in the meantime. We were already pushed into that swimming pool. So we are in a state of emergency. We need to respond to this. We need to react. And these women reacted. In this case, for instance, uh, they had a problem with waste. Um, and um, bad smell and health problems, right? And they felt they needed to do something in this case. So um, they said, okay, we're not going to leave these uh, hurdles and obstacles there for people to have to overcome them. We will overcome them ourselves and give the next generations a better place. Well. Here you see the summary of environmental problems in Costa Rica, right on, on this picture. Now, obviously, we know that uh, we have different problems with waste in Europe. And then we also were talking about uh, drugs as well. This is another problem, which directly affects the different eco uh, communities. And we know that a part of what we see has to do with the underground economy, abductions and violence. I mean, there are a lot of problems. If I destroy a mountain for whatever reason, that mountain doesn't come back. And the dependence on oil uh, is, is huge. And in fact, 80% of everything that we consume comes from elsewhere. And this is another major challenge that we have. And then we have very, very high levels of poverty. Now, we... Uh, have been obviously all involved or, or affected by the COVID pandemic, but in fact, we had uh, previous ones. Uh, we had Hurricane Maria in 2011, which we still hadn't recovered from, sorry, in 2012. And you can imagine that uh, where we live and all these problems is like a cake. And then if you put the icing on the top, which is corruption, you can see that the, the end product is, uh, is interesting to say the least, but th there is a lot of good things about uh, Puerto Rico because uh, we are very active people and we are trying to do something about it. So, 
we have a mix of social, environmental and ecological movements all coming together in Puerto Rico. And here I've brought you a diagram to give you an idea of what we're talking about in perhaps a more schematic way. So you can imagine uh, a beach with all its different elements. Well, we're going to just uh, think about it uh, in a schematic way here to think about everything that we can do. And it's important to do that if we want to train as professionals to work in this field. I'm, uh, I, I lecture in biology in the scientific uh, discipline. And I understand that it's a process, that science is a process and technology is something that we need because otherwise we wouldn't be here today if it weren't for technology. But I understand also that science isn't neutral and it's protected. So when I carry out an important piece of scientific research, uh, for example, if I go to Yunque, which is one of the main tropical forests in Puerto Rico, and it's very well known as well, uh, people who come from uh, Latin America, they always go to this particular, uh, they go and, and, they, and they get part of the forest and it's almost like getting, you know, the spoils of war and uh, they take it back to the to the laboratory and they've done all sorts of tests and they've got a lot of fantastic knowledge from it and they've discovered very important things there and it's just 30 minutes from the airport so it was e easy to access but people say that people who come here and they research and they publish their results and they, you know, that they, they gain international renown for their discoveries. But they're not the ones who stay here grabbing onto the trees and tying themselves to the trees so that the trees don't get cut down. They're not involved in environmental conservation. And it shouldn't be like this. We know what's happening in the Amazon rainforest. We, we've known for decades and we haven't been able to do anything about it. We know what's happening in other parts of the world and we're not doing anything about it. We've got the technology, we've got the knowledge. What's lacking? Well, the will to act. So scientific knowledge per se isn't going to give us the solution. The solution is going to come from elsewhere. And so this approach recognizes this, which is why it joins different disciplines and different tools that can in fact be offered by the whole of the human race. And that's what this graph here aims to illustrate. You can't just look at one element, you have to look at everything. You have to adopt a holistic approach. And that's the main argument of what we do. The first one is uh, to recognize the fact that we're all interrelated. So we have this global outlook and uh, it's great to have this global outlook and we're going to be at a global level linking environmental rights with human rights and that's a really good step forward. That's very positive. But if we look at what happened with Hurricane Maria in September 2017, It was uh, level four, five, and then it went down a little bit, but it doesn't make any difference. It's still strong enough to blow the roof off the top of your house. I don't have a photo there, but in fact, it, you can see, uh, if you see a nighttime photo, you can sort of see the island. It shines. It's like the little night star in the ocean because we've got a lot of light pollution on the island. Now we've been talking about the uh, possible increase or rise in sea level and that's going to have a, a major impact on us. Uh, there's also going to be an acceleration of global warming at a global level and then there's going to be an increase in coastal erosion, in the melting of the ice caps, uh, heat waves. So what 
used to be natural catastrophes or natural phenomena, uh, but they're just becoming exacerbated. I mean, Hurricane Maria, for example, is a natural phenomena, but it's not, it's everything's exacerbated by global warming because when the water levels rose in people's houses it wasn't because of the rainfall that fell during the hurricane it was because uh, of the reservoir that was built nearby uh, which flooded and then it was built wrong and it wasn't built with the safety uh, measures and uh, there wasn't enough warning and in fact people ended up in their houses with water up to their chests and it had to do with planning it wasn't a natural phenomenon And also, if we look at climate risk, this is another interesting perspective to take, especially in relation to children. And the figures are astounding, they're shocking. They're shocking. We're talking about human beings who are at the beginning of their lives. They're just learning how to relate to the environment. And, and what are we showing them? I mean, what are we leaving? What legacy are we leaving them? So I think these figures uh, are just an, an argument enough in and of themselves. Uh, they're, they're a good argument supporting the fact that we have to work together, human rights and environmental rights. And here I'm talking about the socio-ecological and environmental situation. And there are very many examples I can give you, because if I look at Junke, this, this forest, I love going to this forest. But uh, in fact, uh, there are too many people uh, going to the forest. Lots of people like to go. And uh, in fact, we, we're maybe even, even if, if you start calculating, if we actually think about how much food we need to produce for ourselves, we realize we'd actually have to cut down the entire forest in order to have enough agricultural land to produce the food that we all need on the island. So things aren't so simple as they seem. We have a project that's called Casa Pueblo in Puerto Rico. And uh, they uh, went off up into the mountains to become self-sufficient. But they continue, they might uh, grow their own food, but they still need clothes. And that doesn't come from the local area. So this type uh, of education needs to tackle, the education that we want to, 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 to promote needs to ask these difficult questions. Um, um, and what about the, this relationship between the North and the South? Um, and we have uh, the genocides that happen and the awful labor relations which exist in many parts of the planet. Here you can see this little boy here. Uh, he looks like maybe he's sitting on a beach. Well, he's not, no. He's actually suffering from lead pollution. And he's in Asia because he works with the recycling of uh, batteries. The batteries all come from the West. So this is really the argument. So we need to recognize and acknowledge that consciously or unconsciously we are responsible for all of this and here we have the scales between justice and equality now this is something that we see here on the screen now uh really helped me it was a quote by paulo freire he was a thinker and an educator he was also a lawyer in the 19th century he came to Spain and uh, then he went to uh, the United States as well. Uh, he was also involved in the relationship, in forging the relationship between Puerto Rico and, and the US. And more recently, he says, we're going to continue. We must continue uh, to see options and alternatives. Now, I remember I went to see a talk in Spain 
and uh, I can't remember the name of the man who was talking, but they're talking about, okay, we need to look for alternatives and they need to sort of shed a ray of, of hope on everything that's happening. Because uh, there are limits, there are constraints, there are problems, but we need to find the alternatives. We need to find the way forward. Now, this slide is about the peace culture and its different elements, nonviolence, uh, freedom of speech, and their uh, em environmental protection uh, inclu is included there. And also the right to democracy, the right to have a referendum, for example, we did have one, uh, I think, in, in Puerto Rico. They were talking about the annexation to the United States. And in fact, I think over 90 percent voted. But we have to look at what the previous process, the process prior to that was. Because just the fact that people vote is not a guarantee in and of itself. And we have uh, gender equality etc. So uh, the culture of peace is also a good basis uh, for us to work on. Now, uh, the Charter of the Earth uh, is very important as well. This was uh, came out, uh, or it was the Earth Summit was held in Rio, Rio de Janeiro in 1992. So with regard to the Earth Charter, as we said before, uh, there was 1992, we had the Earth Summit celebrated in Rio, held in Rio. And because we all knew that we had to protect the Amazon rainforest from the world. And also it's like, for example, the mangrove, the mangroves, you need to be protected But, uh, of course, there are people that already live there. And it's very hypocritical for me to be sitting here very comfortably in my sitting room generating waste and then saying, no, 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 but you can't touch the Amazon rainforest. No, no, you can't touch the mangrove. No, no, you can't. You can't go in there. No, but I'm here and I'm generating waste and I'm consuming everything, but no one else can go in. And I think this was when this whole process was opened up. And it ended in the year 2000. And... Uh, there was uh, many different groups who recognized the right of the indigenous peoples to live where they live and to, that they have rights as well. Now we know we know that climate change is going to affect some areas more than others. And this is recognized in the Earth Charter. And here, is the, this is what it talks about, the Earth Charter, respect and looking after the community of life. And then, of course, we have the Sustainable Development Goals and the uh, Millennium Development Goals. They were preceded by them. And although they're not binding, but they do provide a very important framework for action. And then uh, eco pedagogy. Now I've given you a lot of information about this uh, movement. It started in Latin America with the outlook of Pablo Freire. But it aims basically to recognize the right of everybody to have the ability to interpret the world from an environmental point of view, to go through a learning process, but not just to learn uh, a content, a specific piece of knowledge, but also to use that in order to improve their quality of life and the quality of life of everyone. And uh, to, to also connect up to what the planet needs. So this author says that uh, there, is a, there was a chapter missing in the education uh, that as it has developed to date. And uh, that missing piece of the panel was eco-pedagogy. Uh, it's an idea of 
being able to understand and uh, interpret and reinterpret human actions which uh, involve violence against the environment. Uh, and it all needs to be rooted in critical thinking. This is some of the elements that uh, um, or main principles of eco-pedagogy. And basically what this process of learning says is that it, it needs to be moving uh, towards uh, a much greater awareness of the world in which we live. I'm not going to read all of this, so don't worry. But what it, it, it also recognizes, eco-pedagogy recognizes eco-pacifism -pacif as an integral part of everything that we do. We see that everything is interrelated. And we also have uh, this, the praxis, the educational practice, and eco-pacifism is all uh, related. So if you're doing a course about climate change, you can't just focus on climate change. You have to focus on uh, other issues as well, issues that are related. Also, uh, spirituality is there, uh, politics, economics, social and cultural, all of these difficult questions. We have to tackle them. We have to ask the hard questions. And uh, in the eco-pacifist approach, uh, what it aims to do is to understand human beings with all our, in all our complexity, all our, with all our creativity. And to, it views reality as something that can be perceived, it's something that can be modified, it's something that can be interpreted, and it should be sustainable. And of course, this all looks very nice on paper, but how can we put it into practice? Well, everything that you do needs to take into account all of these different elements. And then the last area has to do with awareness raising. He, he talked about a, a, a science with a conscience is what he used to talk about, Freire. And, I have, and the idea that there needs to be awareness of the need for action. Unfortunately, uh, this isn't... Uh, perhaps recognized in, in Puerto Rico and in general in the, uh, in the, in the Caribbean. Uh, Freire had to leave Puerto Rico, but he's, he's very well known elsewhere in other Latin American countries. And he goes, education uh, is composed of values, social side, intelligence and talent and knowledge. And there are some, with, in science, you have to learn a certain content. You have to learn about ecosystems and there has to be some kind of evaluation and assessment. And then you get a grade or a mark. I don't know. Uh, when I was a student, I had uh, uh, five things that I had to, five tasks. And I had to decide which task was more important or what I could read and which was more important to read. And sometimes if I'm reading a book, I just, you know, skip some things and skip some chapters because I simply don't have time. But if I don't value what I'm reading or what I'm learning. But if what I'm learning isn't actually linked, doesn't have a connection to what I'm doing to my life, then I'm not going to value it. So it's important to take that into account as well. And eco-peace is another element, and you can see the sub-elements that make that up. I think eco-peace uh, was mainly coined by, by the eco-feminist movement, if I'm not uh, mistaken. And it's, very, it's been worked on a lot in the United States as well. And here, uh, it, basically, we're just saying that we need to look at everything from every single possible perspective. So, some key questions, some key issues. So, I think one key issue is how can we uh, connect? How can we connect pedagogy, the environment and human rights? How can we do that? And which human rights? Uh, how can we do that? So I'm going to try to answer that 
referring back to what I've just explained to you. So how are pedagogy, the environment and human rights connected or interrelated? So I'm going to look at the same situations and, and, and try to answer that question. If I want to increase food production, traditional, uh, and if I, if I need to do that, I have to clear certain areas. Um, how much does it cost? All of these types of analysis. Who is affected? How much is the, how much uh, are farmers going to earn? And how is that going to affect people? How is it going to affect their income level? Now, just very quickly, I wanted to share. I wanted to show you a website. Let me see if I can find it, if I've got time to show you very quickly. Like when I was talking, I was talking about the speech that I was working on when I was 15 years old. It has disappeared. This is a place called El Condado. And uh, if you arrive at the airport, you've got the forest and then you've got a beach nearby. But this wall that you can see here, that's the normal level of sand. We talk about a metre and a half high, is that wall. Well, because the normal cycles of sand would go away, then it would come back throughout the course of the year. And then with the Hurricane Maria had a major effect on that. But in fact, the law says that 200 feet from where, uh, where the waves break, so there has to be 200 feet from that to the wall. And there's no way that there's 200 feet between all of that. So basically, uh, a lot of the coastline was eaten up to build houses. Uh, and now oh, we're saying that this isn't going to happen again, but it happened in the past and it happened often. And then we can see what happened because uh, the sand didn't come back. And then there's another, uh, another area here. This is called uh, people who like biology. I don't know. If you say, what animal do you like? People might say, well, monkeys. Um, which animal do you feel a connection with? And I don't know. Someone might raise their hand and say, I don't know, monkeys or apes or primates or something. You know, I feel a connection with them. And here you can see a hummingbird here. And, and you can see there's this little frog here. Makes a really loud, loud noise. I mean, a lot of people think it's very loud, but in fact, it helps us to sleep. Uh, there's a butterfly, there's a whale, there's mammals as well, tigers, a dog. But I don't know. Would you choose one of these? What's your favourite insect? Snake? Cockroach? But I don't expect they're top of your list, right? Because they live down there, I live up here, and we really don't have very much contact with insects. So we have biophobia <laughs> exists. It's been documented. Biophilia and biophobia. Uh, if, 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 if you see a, a, a chicken with uh, little chicks, uh, people sort of give a stop in the street. So biophobia is like a fear of animals and biophilia is an instinctive attraction for different natural elements. But we only feel it for some animals, not for all of them. Now, we know that communities that have had absolutely no contact with each other have nightmares about the same thing. So it's something common to humans. And it's there. We, we found that uh, in Puerto Rico that the, the, the boys or the children didn't want to go to the forest because they were scared of the dark. Which is, you know, we, we live in... in, in, in in a, an island with lots of forest. 
And uh, people in Puerto Rico are scared of dark because they associate it with danger. And obviously this has all been conveyed to young children and, and they're scared of the dark. So that was just a little uh, aside. Let's go back to the main presentation. So in this uh, question, how are pedagogy, the environment and human rights connected or interrelated? So we can ask, how can we turn an activity that has to do with uh, a research trip, for example, or, or an outing? Well, I have a friend who uh, took the children uh, all the way around the forest and then the different uh, towns and villages to eat the different typical products there. And then at the same time as they did that, they talked about, look, this community's got this problem. They've got this situation. So actually using the very typical route of the outing, the typical school outing, they talked about what each community was doing, the problems it faced. And it became a very specific type of activity. And we could, in fact, carry out scientific measurements uh, as well. And so that uh, the children could learn how research is carried out. But there was also another side, a more human side of everything that they were taught. So I think the idea is to, to talk about the context. And we talked about the context of these different uh, communities. Um, pollution. And the idea then, the, the idea of justice, social justice, climate justice, environmental justice and ecological uh, justice. Okay, because a lot of people say, okay, I want uh, the environment to be healthy because it's healthy for me. I mean, that's very anthropocenic, uh, very centered on ourselves. But it also involves, uh, what about the rights of nature herself? We need to recognize those as well. Because some people might say, well, how much is uh, nature worth? Because when you put a price on it, someone's going to buy it. So this is a sort of debate that we're aiming to uh, spark. Social justice and climate justice. Now, uh, with what specific human rights does eco, the eco-pacifistic approach and the eco-pedagogical approach contribute to? Well, I think dignity, life, liberty, safety, legal personality, equality, free circulation, property, personal well-being, education and rights and obligations. So I think that it, they can contribute to all of these uh, specific human rights, each in uh, its own way. I'm talking about ownership here because it's part of a cultural uh, inheritance for us the capitalist system um, has changed very much over time it is a system that adapts itself very well that's why it, it, it keeps finding new spaces there was an uh, exhibition yesterday morning in a nearby park about all the uh, COP that had been held, or the, the summit, and uh, someone talked to us about the summit uh, that uh, little by little, um, the largest companies started to sponsor and uh, foster these uh, summits, but they are the ones that contribute the most to uh, air pollution, for instance. So this is a very complex topic. We know it is so. Um, personal well-being, education and uh, duties and uh, obligations. You need to fulfill your duties and enjoy your rights. You, you can discuss if one is linked to the other, but there is a, a, an obligation, the obligation to protect nature and to take care of it. This is an example of uh, the activities we carry out. This is what I'm showing you here. Um, this is a task 
to think about our, our own connection with nature. What's your connection? Uh, in the biophilia hypothesis, it, uh, we say, okay, well, um, we can be good at science. We like investigating. And here we're giving seven levels, and we're told there are people that uh, have uh, um, in their skill uh, toolkit, they have uh, imagine food for cats and dogs, but they don't have any cats and dogs. So they look at, uh, they look for cats and dogs to feed some other people. In the mangrove, for instance, there were there were many uh, mosquitoes, and people don't like it and say it's beautiful, it's very important the mangrove. But uh, well, I don't quite like going there, and and that's very that's something we need to respect. And there are other people that whenever they want to relax, they take a chair and sit and look at the sea, and they look for a recording of nature, and do that type of thing. So we as humans connect to nature in different ways and it it doesn't necessarily have to be me going to a demonstration at all so this is a very simple task so if i could be a plant what would i be right or if i could be a tree what would i be in puerto rico we've got very strong trees old trees that resist before hurricanes a teacher used this and the first reaction by a student said it was was quite negative and there were many <clears throat> violent elements coming up but then the same teacher repeated the task again and there was a different awareness so there was like a pre-reaction and a post-reaction it wasn't the intention of the project but this is something that came up to finish with my presentation, I want to show you some of the activities we have generated in our project. We thought that the educational system in Puerto Rico was very traditional, very closed, very rigid, uh, and only teaches some very specific contents. So my idea was to get into that system and, and sow some different seeds because there wasn't a f an official way to go about it. So we had to do it like a virus, you know, get into the system and try and change things. Um, and little by little uh, change the processes and maybe change things that may not be that important and generate new spaces that are more genuine. Um, so. Um, this is why we've got this material that, that's been developed in the project. And uh, I'm going to be finishing my presentation now because I'm running out of time. But I want to show you something very, very quickly. This is a This is one of uh, the little handbooks we've developed, Echo Activate Yourself. This is, a, you see, a guide for scientific outings um, with different activities to carry out measurements, to know the forest better, um, questions about who lives here, what did you observe. So this is that... Uh, a handbook with exercises that concentrates on also on culture, on emotions. They're asked, oh, how did you feel in the process? And people told us, I didn't feel comfortable. I don't want to go back to that forest. And that's, that's something we need to respect as well, of course. It's their opinion. This is a, a guideline for good practice. The University of Puerto Rico. This is a summary of the project, the different elements, and then we uh, came up with a strategy, an eco pacifist and educational strategy. Because in this whole sequence or process, I want students to see the system, the living system, but some other people may have a different starting point. They may want their students to have previous content. And there were, uh, for instance, teachers that carry out 
to visit before telling them anything. So we, we teachers have different approaches as well, right? So um, this is a general strategy where we establish uh, exploration time, then some experiences. We first connect, then we explore, then we evaluate and assess, right? You see the exploration time, that's, a, that's number one, where students are asked, what do you need? You know, if you're hungry, uh, I'm not talking to you about ecology because you need to be fed first of all. So first things first, right? Then we, I don't know the situation in Spain, but in Puerto Rico in the past 10 years, uh, there was this uh, social uh, support given to students that didn't have money to eat, right? So um, this is something that uh, has been up and running in Costa Rica for a long time now. Then uh, there is a second stage with uh, discussion, contact with nature, with natural, the natural side of the human nature. The third stage of the strategy would be reflection and action, participation in a community project, etc. And then finally, there's an assessment carried out, a final decision making. Um, the marks are given out to students. Um, so this is a process that we've developed, the strategy, uh, and in the last stage, we ask questions to our students. What happened? Why didn't you listen to this? Why didn't you like that? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So we want uh, their feedback. And you see the image representing this model looks very much like a hurricane. Funny, isn't it? Well, we are there at the core of the process. We want to give students and learning community many spaces uh, for reaction. And very briefly, let me show you how the different uh, activities of the strategy are developed, right? So we first look at what's going on and then we take the students uh, to the next uh, stage. Let me show you this last example. To you, this is the beta fish. Uh, this is a tail. I don't know if you like this. Uh, if you know about this beta uh, fish, it doesn't need any filtration. It, it, it could live in a glass of water, right? To make a long story short, um, here we work with animal trafficking, the use of animals as pets, how we feed them, etc., etc. It is a very nice tale that enables us to work at different levels. So it, come, it stems from a scientific model of, of nature, right? But the story is quite real, right? About a process, how, how many fish die in the process until we can go to a shop and buy one, etc., etc. I'm just showing you this for you to know. Uh, about one specific uh, exercise or activity that we carry out. And then we ask students, okay, uh, draw a fish. Uh, uh, what will happen to you if you were a fish, etc., etc." So it's a very nice activity then that helps us very much. Um, we came to a house where um, women uh, that have suffered from uh, sexist violence uh, lived. Uh, and they reacted in a very special way to this tale because they, they didn't they, they didn't understand very well because uh, it, 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 it had actually, what happened to the fish had actually happened to these women and their kids, right? They were taken away from their homes because otherwise they, they, was, they were going to be beaten up. <clears throat> this is a project I worked on for eight years. Um, you two have summer camps here, right? Uh, and the aim of summer camps was for children to play and enjoy themselves. And this was a theater summer camp, right? Basically, they worked on the map of the earth, but uh, through theater. So in their process, they incorporated everything that had to do with theater and the planets. If there's a, a conflict, imagine there was a, a struggle between two students and 
uh, we intervene and then we continue with our content normally in a class. But if that happened in, in, in this summer cl uh, camp, since I was teaching empathic communication, since I'm talking about consensus, about mediation, well, I have to walk the talk. So whenever there was a struggle, there was a whole, a whole protocol that was started, right? Um, and then we continued with the content once we had implemented the protocol. So each topic was developed in a very dynamic way. There were some seeds, some ideas, and then there was a theater play that was performed. And why am I showing you this? Because in three weeks time, there were very specific uh, reactions, not having to do with knowledge, but with attitude, with behavior. Well, a father came to us and told us, what is empathic, non-violent empathic language? Because I was talking to my son and uh, he said, Daddy, you be empathic, all, please. And he was like very surprised by, with that answer. And our mother said, well, my son is doing the washing up without me telling him to do so. Because we worked on uh, the topic of water and told them, you're using plastic bottles. What happens with this? How can we change that? Well, let's change things. And we have this washing up station where people, uh, students would do the washing up after lunch. But in, in on day one, there were problems, but on day uh, three, they were fully um, used to the new system and they accepted it very much. So change happened. There was also a protest uh, and this project, this specific project was a good one, um, but the proposal didn't go ahead for the project to be implemented because in, in that process and I have to remind you and tell you that in Puerto Rico many schools close down and imagine if uh, you're going to study Boza, uh, fine arts and the school closes then you can't do anything and there was this day when students came and carried out a, pac a pacifist uh, demonstration and that was a group that was uh, being trained by us because in the process, we also want to empower um, students and tell them we need to be empathic or we need to discuss. But if there aren't, any, if, there, if I'm not achieving anything, we need to move to action and do something about it. So that's what they did. So there's a combination of uh, different pedagogies, um, and uh, this is very effective in the short term. This is what we have observed anyway. Here you can see Juan Antonio Correcher. He is a Puerto Rican poet. He used uh, this beret that made me think of the Basque Country. Uh, he was a student when uh, the US invaded Puerto Rico in 1968 and suddenly imposed an, English, an, an educational system in English, right? And I imagined myself in that time, sitting as a student in a classroom and saying, oh, what's this all about? I don't understand anything. So uh, in that case, he said, I believe we saved ourselves because we could look out of the window and see what uh, they couldn't teach us in the classroom. We looked at Puerto Rico. It was the trees, it was the leaves, it was the breeze, and it was the smell. It was the birds of our country. Those were the true teachers of my generation. So this person, this author promoted the freedom of Puerto Rico at all levels. He's a reference. And as an educator, I needed to know whether this uh, eco pedagogy um, matches our natural uh, tendencies. I wanted to know how our uh, the, our environment changes, and if our environment changes, uh, what are we going to be doing? How are we going to be reacting to this? Um, this is how he reacted. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlos. It's very interesting. It's very motivating. Oh, you really, you really make us like it. Are there questions from the floor? Any contributions or any comments? Don't leave. Please don't go. Let's give him some time. 
Disculpe. Parece que no. Estamos... I would like to ask you something. You said that this came up yesterday, this, uh, this problem of ours, that uh, until we feel something's close to us, we don't worry about it. So this activity you showed us, if I were a plant, if I were a fish, what would I be? What about the opposite road? How much of the nature is already there within us? Because uh, we... we mm, Maybe you shouldn't believe that the nature starts where our skin ends, right? Well, there's a book called El Tao de la Liberación by Wolf, and I can't remember the second author, that tackles that principle, the principle of a more radical principle saying, okay, science is important, we need this, but this is a process we're ignoring, which is that one. I am part of nature. I am nature. Nature begins in me. And a very specific example we use is uh, this Gaia theory, where by all systems in the planet are interrelated as if it were a body. So when I go for lunch, it cannot be processed if I don't have many organs that help me do it. So existentially, I am myself a human being, but I am an addition of other organisms. That's inevitable. And yes, it is crucial to look at things in that way. We sometimes tend to think that nature is there and we are here, but that's not the case. There's a question there. Thank you. Thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. First of all, I'm also a teacher myself. I lecture at the University of the Basque Country. I work on pedagogy and social education, and I teach inclusion and exclusion processes. But for some years now, I'm linking this to the ecology, the environment, and that link, uh, that bond between us and nature. I've been working on that bond for years now and how to create it and generate it because I have the feeling that it's very much in our heads, in our minds, and uh, uh, in the theory we need to teach. But I, I really want to link it more to our bodies, maybe. Uh, you mentioned many resources you have developed, but uh, I would like to know if you uh, know how to work with uh, attitudes in the long term. Imagine, well, we're working here with people that are 20 years of age. Uh, that's my question to you. Thank you. Well, um, I, I agree with you um, in that this is the million dollar question. I mean, I believe, looking at everything I've done and studied, I realize that this is not a linear procedure. So a plan that works well in a specific community very likely will not work in the same way elsewhere. But what you generate, what you th need to think, what type of um, communication activities, awareness activities uh, can help you uh, best uh, change my planning and uh, adapt better to the situation, right? This is not uh, one um, project fits all, right? Um, someone told me, you need to ask them, and it's true. We need to say, okay, I'm here before you, I'm the one having the knowledge and you're getting it. Well, Freire did away with all of this. Um, and therefore, we have more circular type of spaces, right? There's no distance between us because uh, when I uh, teach the, in a learning community, I need to know what their needs are, what their communication codes are, what's the entrance door, right? So I, can, I can't just go there and say, well, how are you? How's your relationship with your family? I need to build trust, first of all, to reach uh, the more qualitative content. I believe that an important variable is patience and also this um, openness in order to realize uh, the situation of students and their challenges. I see colleagues that can identify 
uh, what term they need to use that doesn't generate any confrontation, right? Uh, and uh, in, instead of talking, they just ask and say, look what's happening to you. What would you do? What do you need? So uh, let's not forget about that. And we at the university, we also work in silos sometimes, and I need to, I believe we need to overcome that. We need to be very open. We need to be um, ready to make students part of the process, even if you have to sacrifice content for that. Let me ask one last question. You mentioned uh, the university. It is true that there is a climate change out there. We are in a hurry because we haven't been listening to all the warnings we've been getting. So uh, we're running out of time. We're killing life. And uh, is there other pedagogical resources that are mainstream in the university that can help the people that are going to be employed now and be in touch with experts? Well, there's something that caught my attention, which is obvious, of course, when you have the privilege to get exposed to communities like ours, like yours, is that uh, there's also a cultural element to each community. Um, so uh, I feel that uh, when it comes to adopting SDGs, we need to recognize that all the professionals that are being trained at the, at the university need to get in touch with everything that's going on, that uh, probably what's being done today will be worthless in two years' time. So we need to establish our challenges very clearly as teachers, as professors. And uh, if we don't assess the scientific content at the same level as the uh, headway we make as humans, um, because that can be practiced and developed, then the content will be um, learned by heart and say, okay, I know these 17 SDGs, I know about human rights, I've got the content, but we don't create a bond there. And this is this is so, uh, if you look at wars and how humans has, have uh, solved conflicts in the past, you realize this is so, because that there are people that uh, have told us over and over again, practice peace every single day of your life. Because when, whenever there's a difficulty there, everything will flow much better. I think that this is what should be done uh, in uh, or by the universities. They need to come up with a highly sensitive uh, program. Yes, maybe when love solidarity can be scientifically measured, we will achieve uh, more. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carlos.